welcome to Peninsula Seniors Out and About. We're at the Western Museum of Flight in Torrance. Let's go see what Cindy has for us today. 25 years ago, today, is when I was flying combat missions in Kuwait. Now, I can't tell you more about the way we operate as uh, Marine Corps pilots in the Harry community without telling you a little bit about how the Marine Corps is organized and the mission of our Harriers. Um, Marine Corps is task organized, and we call it the Marine Air Ground Task Force, or MAGTAF. And, and the MAGTAF is scalable. It's scalable in size, but the commonality of a MAGTAF is there's a headquarters element, there's an aviation combat element, there's a ground combat element, and there's a combat service support element. They're scaled between the smallest MAGTAF is a MU, Marine Expeditionary Unit, commanded by a Marine Corps colonel. The next uh, larger size is the Marine Expeditionary Brigade, commanded by a one-star general. And then the Marine Expeditionary Force is commanded by a two-star general. So a Marine Expeditionary Force will have an entire air wing available to support its mission. A Marine Expeditionary Unit has an aviation combat unit comprised of a um, V-22 squadron with augmented uh, aircraft from a Harrier, from the UH-1 uh, Zulu, AH-1 Zulu and UH-1 Yankee and CH-53 aircraft, and that's the aviation combat unit uh, for a Marine Expeditionary Unit. The function of the Marine Aviation uh, are six. Uh, we have air reconnaissance, anti-air warfare, assault support, control of aircraft missiles, electronic warfare, and offensive air support. Uh, the Harrier is able to help with all of those, um, except for maybe control of aircraft and missiles. Those are our, our MAX Marines. So the Harrier mission, to attack and destroy service and air targets, escort helicopters, and perform any missions that may be directed. Specific tasks, close air support, deep air support, offensive and defensive anti-air warfare, uh, nighttime operations, self-deploy operations with the use of tankers, and then um, operate from uh, expeditionary bases. So way back when, August 2nd of uh, 1990, Iraq wanted to take advantage of the Kuwaiti oil fields, and they moved into Kuwait. The NATO coalition said, no, we're not going to let you do that. Um, so 2nd of August is when that happened. On the 15th of August, uh, I was a young captain. My squadron flew with 20 aircraft from Yuma, Arizona to Cherry Point, North Carolina. We repainted our jets uh, to get away from that dark, uh, dark green and black camouflage configuration to a light gray and dark gray camouflage configuration. And then we flew from Cherry Point to Roe to Spain, and then we flew from Roe to Spain to Bahrain. And we landed at Sheikh Issa Air Base in, in the country of Bahrain on the Persian Gulf. And we landed there on the 19th of August. So 2nd of August, Saddam Hussein invaded. On the 19th of August, Marine Harriers were in theater ready to go to war. We then moved up to King Abdulaziz Naval Base on the 24th of August, which was closer to Kuwait than the main base. Other aircraft moved uh, into uh, Riyadh, Persian Gulf, and the Red Sea. So we're building our forces, we're preparing for flight, and we're getting ready for an air war followed by a, a ground offensive to remove uh, the Iraqi influences from Kuwait. This is an AV-8B. It's a day attack because you don't see the forward-looking infrared on top of the nose. We still have the angle rate bombing system. Under the wings are uh, the Mark 20 Rock Eye canister munition. Each Mark 20 Rock Eye consists of 247 individual bomblets. Imagine a beer can with a spiked nose and tail feathers that has about a three-pound explosive fill. Um, it, it's I, used ideally for um, light skin vehicle and for clearing um, obstacles. And we had AIM-9 mics. And then you also see the GAU-12 25 millimeter gun. Uh, this photo was taken uh, shortly after we arrived at King Abdulaziz Naval Base. It was an 8,000 foot strip with a small parking apron at the departure end. Uh, so it wasn't improved at the time. Uh, and we're all living out of that soccer stadium you see on the left part of the image. We're sleeping in the bleachers because CBs haven't come in and built our strong back tents for us or provided uh, food service with our Marine Wing support squadrons. 
Eventually, uh, this, this base alone built up to um, three Harrier squadrons, uh, six aircraft detachment, and we had a squadron of 20 aircraft on the USS Nassau in the Persian Gulf. So because we were forward, the, the mission of the Harrier is to be forward deployed. It is to be close to that battlefield. It is to be on call so that the Marines that need us were only a very short flight away. We actually had our main base at King Abdulaziz Naval Base, which is about 110 miles from the border. And we used a Arab American Oil Company airfield at Tanajib, which is about 40 miles from the Kuwaiti border. 40 miles isn't very far from the border of Kuwait. So what were our missions like? We would uh, take off from King Abdulaziz Naval Base. Um, we would uh, check in with a, a tactical air operations center uh, with our uh, mission as fragged or with exceptions depending upon our ordnance load. They would hand us off to the direct air support coordination center, the DASC, for uh, either terminal control with a forward air controller or tell us to fly our mission, which was uh, pre-planned. We would fly our mission uh, and then we would return to Tanaji. We don't have to go all the way back to the main base. We have that forward basing concept that the Marine Corps uses. So now we're only going 40 miles back to Tanaji. Uh, we land, we, we debrief with our intelligence folks, we get new fuel, we get more bombs, and in a, about a 20 minute period of deck time, we're able to get back in the air and do a second mission inside Kuwait. And that mission could be a close air support mission, it could be a deep strike mission, we could go to a kill box and look for scuds, we can look for um, um, radars, we can look for vehicles. And then when that mission was over, we would come back to the main base and debrief for the day. Near the later stages of the war, I was flying three missions like that in about an eight hour period. I had a real good friend, uh, a Navy pilot who was aboard the USS America flying out of um, the Red Sea. Um, and when he was flying, he was, able, he was able to do one mission in about nine hours because they were so far away from the battle. And he would do air refueling several times. So Harriers, uh, we had three land-based squadrons and a one sea-based squadron. Uh, during Desert Storm, uh, we had 86 aircraft, and we had uh, 3,380 flights, 4,100 flight hours, uh, dropping more than 8 million pounds of ordnance. Our mission capable rate was very high at 88%, and we had that 20 to 25 minute turnaround time. Uh, General Schwarzkopf called the uh, AV-8 one of the best weapon systems that he was able to use in that conflict. So today in our little more than hour presentation, uh, hopefully, uh, I was able to uh, share some of the Harrier history with you, some of the great engineering that went into making the Harrier uh, a remarkable uh, weapon platform, a remarkable weapon system, a little bit about what it takes to fly a Harrier, and then a, just a little bit about what it's like with combat operations in theater. I like this photo because it shows the uh, heads-up display uh, from that formation you just saw moments ago. So if you ask any Harrier pilot, he will be the first to tell you that it is far better to stop and then land than it is to land and then stop. <laughs> Our second guest of honor today um, was uh, introduced earlier, but Brian Long. Brian, please stand up. <clears throat> Brian Long is a machinist and he was making handmade parts for that early uh, P1127 and Kestrel Harrier in the UK. Uh, ultimately uh, came to the US in 67 with uh, manufacturing of other aircraft components for 747 and Northrop Grumman. But Brian, I thank you for your leadership uh, and, and your uh, willingness to, to make uh, one of a kind parts for this aircraft uh, that made it such a wonderful flying machine. I greatly appreciate your time and attention. Thank you very much. The question is, the five losses during Desert Storm and were there any commonalities and were any uh, from my squadron? Um, uh, yes, um, is the short answer. 
Um, our, the, the first um, Harrier casualty to combat was from my squadron, a, a real good friend um, who was shot down by a surface-to-air missile. Um, we all thought that he perished in that shoot-down. During the ejection sequence, well, first off, his wingman uh, didn't see him uh, after the first target attack. Uh, wingman lost sight of him. Um, uh, there was no um, automatic uh, uh, signal during ejection with a, with a beacon that should sound upon ejection. Um, we didn't hear him uh, on the ground with his handheld emergency radio. So with, with, without any of those three, we all presumed that he was in that aircraft. And, and we, we, we thought that, I thought that, all the way up until the end of uh, hostilities, uh, when I was sent out as the safety officer to find his wreckage and determine what happened. We knew his target attack. Um, went out to that site. On the first day, I didn't see anything. On the second day, in the back of the helicopter, I look down at the ground, and I see a pair of hot nozzles sticking up at me. And I say, that's his aircraft. We land. And I only see the front half of his aircraft. I don't see his tail. He didn't get any of his bombs off. Um, he had four Mark 20 canister munitions, each with 247 bomblets, and they were spewed around in a debris field that was very extensive uh, in, in a left-hand configuration, so he was spinning, spinning hard left inverted. Uh, the aircraft was upside down. I was convinced at that time that had I had a shovel, I could have found him strapped into his seat. Um, documented the area, uh, took pictures, took drawings, went back to the commanding officer of the Marine Aircraft Group, briefed him on what I had found, and that's when he told me that my friend ejected safely and he was a prisoner of war for 37 days. I, I literally broke down and cried. Um, but yes, we, we did lose har uh, Harriers. Um, three of them were shot down with surface fire. Uh, my friend was one. A uh, second one was shot down and also held um, prisoner for about 30 to 33 days. A uh, third one was shot down by surface fire, uh, and he ejected just as the Marines were progressing through the airfield upon which he landed, so he came back to his um, uh, squadron right away. Um, we lost uh, one Marine um, during a night mission. It was a fatality. Um, and we, th we think that there was a combination of ground fire and possibly target fixation in a night bombing run, a very steep angle. And then the fifth one was um, lost in the carrier environment. I don't think that one was combat related, um, but it was just during that time period. So did that answer your question? Okay. Next question, right here. First question, uh, comment briefly on the F-35. And then the second question was uh, a vectored thrust that allowed a Harrier to stop and a tornado to shoot by and shoot him down. Uh, on the JSF front, um, JSF is doing extremely well for the Marine Corps. The Marine Corps has declared initial operational capability. We have a JSF squadron down in Yuma right now, VMFA-121, and they're flying alongside Harriers. Uh, eventually, all of the Harrier squadrons uh, and the F-18 Alpha squadrons in the Marine Corps will be phased uh, into the JSF, and that program is proceeding extremely well. Uh, on the um, Falklands Island question, I, I have heard accounts of that story, but I don't know details uh, to know um, uh, specifically what happened or what weapons were used in that conflict, but I, I did hear about that. Uh, the question is water injection, how was it used and, and how does it um, disturb um, mass flow? Um, water is injected into the exhaust burner. It, it's an annular burner system uh, and it's used to help cool the burner so that we can sustain higher, higher temperature. So it doesn't really affect mass flow per se, it gives us uh, added engine performance. The question was, um, pilot training, uh, the time and money spent and complexity. Is that correct? Okay, um, I'll, I'll, I'll give you my example. 
Um, I was uh, winged in uh, March of 88. By October of 88, I was in my first Harrier squadron. So from March to October was my time in the squadron VMAT 203 out of Cherry Point um, that has uh, the, the Harrier pilot training mission. And the majority of my time in that squadron was in the uh, VSTAL regime. Um, we're already winged aviators. We know how to fly wing-borne flight. That's easy. Um, the the VSTAL regime is where we spent the majority of our pilot training. Uh, we have very, very good simulations, um, simulators. We have fixed base simulators um, and, and, and uh, moving simulators, I think we have now. Um, but that simulation um, uh, process and then the T-Birds that we have and then ultimately um, the single seat jets allows us to progress through that pipeline in about six months time, which is what the Marine Corps um, looks, looks at for um, keeping pace with the needs of the fleet. Question in the back, yes ma'am. The um, question is, uh, Aviate's known as the, the widow maker, uh, had, had very high crash rates in early development. Um, and if I was concerned, um, I wasn't concerned. If you'd ask my wife, you may get a different answer. Um, but I, 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 knew, I knew the training, I knew the, I knew the discipline, I knew the syllabus, I knew the engineering behind the uh, aircraft. The early AV-8A um, was a more challenging aircraft to fly. The uh, deceleration and acceleration corridors uh, were, were, were very narrow. You could not um, uh, get outside those boundaries uh, if you allowed angle of attack to uh, increase too much or if you allowed side slip to increase too much and, and, and the combination of airspeed, angle bank, side slip could put you in a position where you could not recover control flight. Um, that happened uh, uh, early on in the development. With the uh, AV-8B and the st uh, increased stability augmentation system that we had, uh, our, our, our flight control computers were doing a lot of that background work for us, allowing us to focus more on, on other tasks and duties. Um, so I, I think the aircraft today is, is a very safe, very capable aircraft. Um, in early uh, aircraft development programs, there are very high mishap rates. Uh, the F-16 had a very high mishap rate when it was being developed. Um, so we're, we're, we're kind of similar to that, I think. But I was never concerned. Thank you. Question over here. The question is, what additional um, warnings, uh, cockpit indications do we have uh, so that we, we don't go near those limits? Does that characterize your question? Um, in the, if you see an AV-8, B, and you probably may see it on that, we have, we have a weather vane uh, right on top of the nose that the pilot can see, and that is very good at telling us if we have um, side slip buildup. Um, we have instruments that show our angle of attack, but we also have a rudder pedal shaker. Um, much, much like a, a pilot may have a rudder pedal shaker or a stick shaker as you're approaching stall, um, we have a rudder pedal shaker. If side slip begins to build up too much, the, 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 the rudder will shake where we need to step as a pilot. So if, if side slip builds up too much from the left, the, the left rudder will shake and we need to step on that, on that rudder to reduce that side slip. So that helps us uh, in, in that area where we may not be focused on other aspects of flying and, and not, uh, not center of the side slip. The question is, what aircraft are the Brits using to replace the Harriers they sold to US? Um, nothing. They're, they're waiting for the Joint Strike Fighter. So the um, Brits uh, right now don't have a fixed wing arm in the Royal Navy uh, for their uh, protection of the fleet. They're, they're waiting for the JSF. That's a very good question. Um, the question is, uh, when you're hovering, how, what, what's happening to that column of air when it hits the ground and, and goes out to the sides? Does that characterize your question? Okay, so you have the two hot nozzles and the two cold nozzles, and they essentially form a single column of air. And that column of air hits the ground and it goes out in all directions. So the, the, the column of air between the left and right, as it hits the ground, it also comes forward, and when it comes forward, it comes back and, hit, and, and comes vertically. So we have 
uh, on the uh, AV-8B and the GR-5 and later series of aircraft, very large surfboard size strakes. And I, I didn't point them out, uh, you can't see them in that. Um, very large surfboard size strakes. And we also have a little door that comes down behind the nose landing gear. And then we have the speed brake in the back. So that system is called LIDS. And that stands for Lift Improvement, Lift Improvement Development System. Um, that's able to give us about another 1,200 pounds of, of lift as we're coming down within ground effect uh, before our landing. Uh, but when that, when that column of air is off center, if, if I roll right wing down and I want to translate right, that aircraft fuselage is rolling to the right, that column shifts to the right, and that allows me to have a little bit of momentum so that I can translate right very easily. And I will continue to translate. Great, a great law of physics. Once, once I get stabilized in that sideward flight, I'll continue that until something happens. And that something happens is I apply opposite stick to, to stop that rate of motion. I get that center column of thrust beneath me, get it righted, and now I'm in a new position. So if I want to go back in order to land back at where I took off from, I apply left stick, that, that column shifts, the reaction control system works, and now I, I translate sideways to my desired uh, spot. I apply right stick to stop, and I get centered again. And it, it, it's, a, it, it's a very, with the, once you get used to flying that aircraft, it's very intuitive to, to fly and maneuver and position where you want to position. During carrier operations, um, we typically come abeam the landing ship at about a, um, we, we, we want a 50-foot deck height above this spot. Uh, uh, deck to water is about uh, 60 feet, so about 110 foot uh, beam the spot of our intended landing yeah, so we can see where we're going to land. Um, we, we translate over the carrier deck, and now we're focused on that big yellow tram line, and we have a hover position indicator that's on the island to help us with forward aft cues as well as what we see aboard the deck. And, and we practice to very routinely land exactly on center line, exactly forward or aft, and we're able to do that with precision on a routine basis. If you uh, want to take a look at a really neat video on YouTube, there's a Marine Harrier pilot, a captain, who had trouble with his nose landing gear, and he had to come back in and land on a little stool that they put where his, his nose gear would be residing, and, and, and they put it exactly on center line and exactly on the spot where he should land. He couldn't see the stool because it was below his nose, so he came in and he, he did his normal Harrier precision landing, and he landed beautifully. Little bounce on that mattress, it, the jet was fine, jacked it up, put the gear down, probably flew the next day. So very, very capable. Uh, two more questions right here. The question is in the uh, nozzle control drills and the hover stop flop. Um, the, the intakes on the Harrier um, are, are and, and the boundary layer doors and, and the intake suction doors um, uh, all allow for an incredible air mass to, to progress through the engine. I've never had a compressor stall or surge. Uh, the uh, uh, mass flow has never been interrupted from a hover stop flop. What, one more question, sir? Certainly. A uh, question centered on the ejection system uh, of the Harrier. Uh, in the early Harriers uh, and in the British Harriers, they used a Martin Baker ejection seat. Um, in the uh, McDonnell Douglas Harriers, uh, now Boeing, uh, we have a stencil ejection seat, and it's called a zero zero ejection seat, meaning that I can be at zero altitude and zero forward airspeed. I can eject and I can get at least one, maybe half a swing out of my parachute before I hit the ground. So, so how does that work? Um, the, the canopy on the Harrier doesn't eject. Uh, there's a mild detonation cord, which is that Christmas tree pattern that you see on, on, on the top of the canopy. So when, when the pilot ejects, uh, pulls a handle, um, shoulder strains are pulled back, 
I'm wearing leg garters around my legs so they're cinched in so I don't get any flail injury. At that exact same time, the canopy shatters above me. At that exact same time, the rocket on my seat fires and I'm ejected from my aircraft. Maybe a half second, two seconds later, depending on, there is an airspeed and altitude sensor which, which can control when things happen next. In a zero-zero situation, um, a, a ballistic spreader gun will fire out the top of my head box where my parachute resides, and, and there's little weights around the bottom skirt of, of my canopy, and, and that ballistic, ballistic spreader gun will instantaneously push out the parachute so that I'm instantly under canopy and allow me to um, land uh, back to Earth. In higher airspeed and higher altitude conditions, that ballistic spreader gun is delayed until a seat man separation occurs uh, and I get to a um, lower altitude uh, in order to um, affect that parachute recovery. It has been a true privilege and a true honor to be able to share the story of the Harrier and to be here for the unveiling of the T-4 with the Western Museum of Flight and the California Science Center. I greatly appreciate your time and attention. Thank you very much. Thank you for watching Peninsula Seniors Out and About. I'm Betty Wheaton. See you next time.